Hi, I'm Susan Weisbauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all kinds of settings. We are so excited to be coming to you with our very first podcast episode. And uh, we thought we would start out by telling you a little bit about our personal stories, our experiences with home education, because we are both experienced home educators in one way or another, but then just with education generally. Suzanne and I both were home educated, but then we have experience in a lot of different educational settings. And we want you to know uh, where we're coming from. I'll just start out with a little bit of my story, and then I'll turn it over to Susanna for hers. My mother started to home educate us back in 1972, and it really was for purely educational reasons. She had been a fifth and sixth grade teacher. She had been an elementary school principal. She had taught in four different U.S. states. Um, She had taught overseas, and she did not have confidence that if she sent us off to school, so I have an older brother and a younger sister, that the schools would give us what we needed, particularly for foundational skills, because the last year of teaching before she had kids, she had two sixth graders in her class who still had not learned how to read because they had just been passed along from grade to grade. So she thought to herself, well, I'm at least going to make sure that these kids know how to read. So she taught my brother how to read when he was little. He was probably four. I was two. I always wanted to do everything my brother did. So I insisted on learning how to read at the same time. And she sent first my brother and then me off to school. And what she discovered was that she had she had gotten us seriously out of sync with the classroom. We already knew everything that was happening in the classroom. And we were both really bored. My brother reacted by being sort of a, I love my brother very much, know-it-all chatterbox and continually interrupting the teacher and helping the teacher improve, which she didn't really appreciate. I reacted by just going and getting books and going in a corner and reading and tuning out because I was so bored with what we were doing in the classroom. So my mother kept getting called in for these parent-teacher conferences where they were like, your son is disrupting class. Your daughter's clearly antisocial and may need therapy because all she wants to do is read. And my mother didn't know what to do with us. So she took us to the local mental health clinic to find out what was wrong with us. And she, you know, providentially uh, encountered this psychiatrist who tested us and said, yeah, the problem is they're bored. You did too good a job. And he said in 1972, why don't you take them out of school and teach them yourself? You have a teacher's certificate. And, you know, this was a time when nobody we knew was homeschooling. We didn't know there was such a thing as homeschooling. In fact, eventually we got to testify in the hearings that made homeschooling legal in Virginia, because at this point it really wasn't. So my mother Really, she started to home educate us, not as an act of withdrawal or separation, not out of conviction. She started homeschooling us kind of out of desperation. And I have to say, I hear this story a lot now from parents who are homeschooling out of desperation because they've tried so many other things and those things simply haven't worked. So that's how we got started in education, really for academic reasons, Um, because we were out of sync with the classroom. Now, that, of course, is not the end of the story. As it happened, we then got involved in a local church, which eventually developed some very, what I would call, cultish overtones in terms of controlling its members, requiring members to be very um, accountable to the leadership for what they what they watched on TV, how they spent their money, who they dated, what jobs they took. If anyone is interested, you can look up the Gulf Coast shepherding movement. Uh, that is the one that the church we were in um, got involved in, and it was very controlling, very separationist. They had a lot of emphasis on raising children to be holy. They used a lot of the materials from Bill Gothard's Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts, which, you know, now as an adult, I look back on that material with a little bit of horror, to be honest, because of how manipulative it was And when I say manipulative, I mean the emphasis was on making sure children behave in a certain way. 
making sure that they checked a lot of external boxes. So, you know, we were in this sort of cultish church situation. We were being given by the leadership of this church a lot of educational materials, which were, in my opinion, manipulative and separative and not educationally sound. And then, you know, as it happened, we also lived on a farm, which meant we were in a rural environment without a lot of people around. So when I look back at my homeschooling experience. It's this odd mix of freedom and exploration and delight and the space to do things that I was really interested in and a lack of pressure to do things I didn't really care about. I was fascinated by languages. And so my mother let me spend as much time as I wanted learning Gaelic and Welsh and Hebrew and all of these things just because I was interested in them. My father was a huge opera fan and he tried us on opera and we were like, what is happening here? No, thank you. So he got us into light opera and we all became huge Gilbert and Sullivan fans. And I have to say, I'm still one of the only people my age I know who can like sing through an entire Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. And that's something we've passed on to our kids. So that aspect of homeschooling was so wonderful and freeing and delightful to me. And yet at the same time, coming from more of the church side of things, there was this intense emphasis on the world is evil and you must be protected from it, particularly anything having to do with sex, anything having to do with dating, anything having to do, you know, in my case, with boys, anything having to do with entertainment. We were allowed to read anything we wanted. And I'm pretty sure my mother was not aware of some of the books that I checked out of the Williamsburg Public Library. But anything that had a screen was very, very closely guarded um, and controlled. And there was this sense of fear that permeated, uh, particularly as I got into high school, everything that we did in terms of preparing for college, you know, getting ready to go out into the what we had been taught was this big bad world that was aimed to corrupt us. So one of the things that I look back on with a little bit of regret is that I went to college not with a sense of this is going to be a time of intellectual exploration, but rather I went into college with this attitude of this will not corrupt me. You know, I will stay pure. I will reject anything that I've been taught is bad. And that's something that, you know, it takes a long time as you grow and mature to work through it. When I finally did get on into graduate school, to my great surprise, I encountered people who were not even Christians, who had a great deal of wisdom and compassion and knowledge to share with me and things that they needed to teach me. You know, so in, so in one way, I feel like my homeschool experience just prepared me for this wonderful adult life where I knew how to enjoy and explore and follow up on what I was interested in. And then on the other hand, you know, <laughs> gave me a few challenges to overcome in the way that I approached the project of learning. So, yeah, in a nutshell, that was my experience uh, with homeschooling. And uh, Susanna, I'm really anxious for you to share yours. I'll just end by saying one of the really transitional times for me was when I did get a PhD and I started teaching at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And I had freshmen who were good, faithful Christians who had been to public school. And I'm not kidding you. It was it was a bit of a what moment for me <laughs> that that was a thing that could happen. And that is that is when I really began to work through some of the assumptions that I had carried into graduate school and into my adult life from this particular kind of upbringing. Mm. So that's my story. Well, thank you for sharing that. That is it's fascinating because in so many ways, I relate to what you're saying with that mix of freedom and I guess the word I might use is control. And on a good day, I look back at my childhood and just appreciate all of the freedoms I had 
And on other days when I'm not feeling so well or feel like feeling sorry for myself, I think about all of these ways in which I was so controlled. So my story in some ways is similar to yours, but in some ways it's different. My mother was also trained as a teacher, um, but she and my father were both raised in a Christian group called the Lord's Recovery, which is a group started by a man from China named Witness Lee and the people in it follow his interpretations of the Bible. They were raising it from children. And when I was four, the church wanted to spread from Southern California where it was, where it kind of centered to other parts of the U.S. and eventually the world. So every year they would choose cities and and send a group of families to that city. So we we came to North Carolina when I was four, which is why I, I lived in North Carolina with a whole bunch of people from the West Coast. So I don't have much of a Southern accent, even though I've been here my whole life. Um, people say people say that to me too when I say I'm from Virginia. They yeah. say you don't sound like it. <laughs> How come? Yeah. So most of the people I knew were from the West Coast, despite the fact that I've been here. Anyhow, my mother saw other sisters. We called each other brothers and sisters in the church homeschooling. Not everyone in the church homeschooled, but quite a few people did. And she was very impressed with it. And it came from the same desire that you mentioned that in the church, it was very much emphasized that the world was this this evil place out there. And we want to protect our children from that. And my mom's goal in raising us really was to raise vessels that would be useful to God and to the church specifically. They truly believe that, you know, Jesus is coming again very soon and that the church needed to raise young people to bring that on, that it's always young people that bring in a new age. Mm -hmm. Um, David was young and all of these other people were young. So we were supposed to be these vessels to bring in the next age and had to be preserved from the world. World. My mother had a lot of um, desire to to save us. She was also raised in a in East LA, so she had dealt with a lot of difficult things in a growing up in a difficult part of town, and she didn't want us to have to deal with those things. My father was more skeptical. He was an educational idealist. He actually got through public school, college, and didn't feel like he had been educated. He wasn't satisfied with the education he had, so he applied, got into, and went to law school with no interest in practicing law. He just wanted the challenge and he did it. He, he got through law school. He might have practiced law for a few years after they got married, but my whole childhood, he never practiced law, but he had that law degree and he loved, he spoke very fondly of his time uh, in law school. So my mom took him to a homeschool conference and he started to see all these resources they could use. I think he started dreaming in his head this, you know, he could try different programs. He could experiment with his kids and they, they got all the way on board so much so that they actually homeschooled all seven of us kids from the time we were in kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. So none of us ever stepped into a school until a couple of us ended up becoming teachers, which is kind of funny. I don't know if there is a deep inward unspoken wish that we had been to school. So we had to become teachers if there was. I was not aware of it as a child. I was very happy to be homeschooled. But anyway, that's another story for another day. So we were homeschooled. My mom, um, my mom pretty much took care of the elementary student. So I have these very warm memories growing up of coming downstairs and having breakfast with my siblings and then gathering around to read the story of the world was one of my favorite parts of the day or read the Bible. Oh. <laughs> I loved, loved reading the story of the world. Shameless plug there. But um, <laughs> um, so but we switched around a lot and like how we homeschooled one year, my mom got into Charlotte Mason and one year we got into classical and sometimes we tried co-ops, but that never lasted for very long. Actually, funny story in high school, I wanted to go into a co-op because they had a worldview class and I had just read some books about different religions and things I wasn't aware of before. And I was really interested in like talking about them with other people. And so I wanted to join this worldview class. We went to the homeschool co-op and sometime during the class, I let it slip that my family didn't believe that the earth was 6,000 years old and we got kicked out of the co-op. So, so much for that worldview class. <laughs> oh, Susanna, I am feeling another podcast episode coming on. We are going to have the co-op conversation. Okay, we'll have the co-op right. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so our community was really just church. We were in church every day and homeschooling at home. Um, the one constant throughout all of that was beyond just going to church every day was, um, was, was books and reading. We, we homeschooled all different kinds of ways, but we were always reading. And there was one year, I think my mom was tired. I don't know if she'd had a, a child or if we were moving or something, but we, there was one year 
we just read. That's all we did. My dad created this um, form to make sure that we were reading enough books in science and enough books in history. But as long as we logged enough books and enough categories, that's all we had to do that year, which turned out to be a really fun year for me. I think I was in middle school. I loved it. Um, So we read, read, read. I remember my, I have to come to my mom with my stack of books and we we went to the library with suitcases. I'd come with my stack of books and I'd kind of hide the one that had maybe a reference to magic right in the middle or middle to (laughs) end to see if it could slip by her, but it didn't. My mom very much censored what we read as young children. Sometimes I would hide a book I was reading in the dustiest reference book in the library, hoping no one would come to it before I got back to the library the next week. Um, But eventually I found a loophole with classics. My parents wanted us to read all the classics. So while Animorphs were too scary because they had, I don't know, interesting covers by middle school, I was reading Oliver Twist and Crime and Punishment and all kinds of things that, like you said, I'm sure my my parents could not have known what I was ingesting. But um, I really, I really enjoyed reading the classics because I could read whatever I wanted. (laughs) And there are all these interesting stories about human nature that fascinated me. But then by the time high school got around, and this is where that that balance comes in, on the one hand, it seemed like we weren't allowed to question spiritually and theologically, we weren't allowed to ask any questions. And that was just that. There was one person whose interpretations were always correct. But then academically, my dad did not want us to fall into the category of Christians who went to their freshman year of college and encountered ideas they'd never heard before and just were surprised and felt ambushed or or lied to and gave up on their faith completely. So my dad determined that we should read all the best arguments for the things we didn't believe. We had to read Darwin. We had to read Hawkins. We had to read the best arguments for evolution and the best arguments against it. We had to read all kinds of things because he didn't want us to be surprised by it. He wanted us to, to know the source material. And so I was being asked to question these authors and ask questions in every area of my life, except theologically. Um, so that was this kind of odd, um, dissonance, definitely. dissonance. Yeah, yeah. That I felt because I enjoyed the questioning. I think that's part of why I studied history, um, was I enjoyed reading an argument and pulling it apart. And so I, I went off to college and, and I felt really prepared. Like I was ready by that time. I was so ready to talk about books with other people, not just myself and my papers. I enjoyed college immensely, but like you said, with that dissonance, it was something that kind of bothered me that I had been raised and taught by my own parents to ask questions about everything except for this one thing. And so that always leaves me wondering, you know, from the outside looking in, we looked like this very conservative, you might even say culty family, went to church every day. We wore skirts and dresses. We had, you know, clothes up to the collarbone. But on the other hand, we were getting a great education with those blind spots, you might say. And you and I have discussed this. And by the way, you guys can't see her, but Susanna is wearing a really lovely square necked, uh, (laughs) fashionable, uh, fitted black shirt. (laughs) You're making me blush. I'm going to cover it with my hair. (laughs) (laughs) So she's moved beyond that particular part of her upbringing. So you and I have have talked about how we both and, and I think let me just say any upbringing, any education, you can look at pros and cons. You can say this right. was good. This didn't work so well. Um, but talk specifically about, you know, so, and you've mentioned some of them, some of the really great pros about this particular kind of education that you had. Yeah. Um, so there's there are so many. I would say one of the things that I would say is a pro that my husband actually mentions all the time. He's like, you're really good at this. I'm like, oh, I think that was my dad. Um, My dad always emphasized goal setting. From the time I was in kindergarten, we started the year with, what do you want for your goals this year? Um, What are your spiritual goals, your physical goals, your academic goals? And then what are the things to do to get there? And so they did that to the extent that by the time we were in high school, we were essentially on our own. Mm -hmm. I met with my dad in high school, maybe once every two months and only when I asked for a meeting. Right. So he always talked 
talked about first things first from, you know, making your bed before reading your book or whatever it was, I felt like they did a really good job of emphasizing that. And and funnily enough, it was part of this idea that, you know, the world is ending soon and you're part of that and you need to make the most of your time. There's this booklet I read multiple times every year from the time I turned 13 about how as a Christian, I had to redeem my time and I had to make every year last I had to get seven years worth of stuff done every year because that's how valuable wow. my time was as a Christian. And I believed that. <laughs> um, so it sounds like a lot of pressure. <laughs> it was pressure. And I did push myself pretty hard in high school, <laughs> but I, I took away that goal setting. I think that was really good. And then beyond that, like you talked about the freedom to explore my hobbies. I spent hours every day from the time I was 10 to 16, just in the forest behind our house. And I had time to enjoy those moments of imagination in the woods and also pursue pursue piano and languages and other hobbies, just so much time by being homeschooled. And for me, the socialization part, the age old homeschool question, what about socialization? It wasn't a problem. And I have this weird theory that reading books prepares you to socialize because you see inside of other people's minds and yeah. learn how other people think and aren't so naive because you know what human nature can really be. Um, but those three things, I felt prepared socially. I felt prepared goal wise for college and I had just a wonderful free time exploring the woods. What would you say would be your biggest pros? I mean, I definitely had those same pros in terms of, I mean, I had freedom and time to mm -hmm. pursue any activity or any field of study I wanted to. There there are for me also these pros that they're kind of the absence of negatives and that I was just me. I didn't have mm -hmm. any peer standards to measure myself against. When I look back on being in, you know, particularly as a girl, being in middle school and high school, I never felt criticized. I never felt judged. I never felt held up to a standard that I couldn't meet. I was just me doing my own thing. You know, I wasn't manipulated. I wasn't abused. I wasn't taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So in that way, that sort of protective aspect of homeschooling was really lovely for me. And, and I think I think I could sort of sum this up by saying I came out of my high school years with the, the mindset that was, if there's something that I want to do, I will figure out how to do it. I'll research it. I'll get resources and then I'll do it. And we'll see what happens, you know, which which is still something I do all the time. I think it's why I've started mm -hmm. a number of different businesses. Uh, my husband and I talk about this all the time where he says, you know, wouldn't it be great to try X? And I say, oh, OK, let's do it. And he sort of gets this deer in the headlights look like, wait, that's not how people respond. But that's how I grew up. If I wanted to do something, I just tried it and figured it out on the fly. And I mean, I think that's just been the most wonderful preparation for adult life, particularly in the gig economy, you know, that we're right. now all part of uh, that I can possibly think of. Now, I mean, I guess there are cons to this, too, in that I really, particularly when I went into college, I did not have any peer smarts at all, like none. Looking back on it, I'm not sure in the long run how much of a disadvantage that was, but it certainly made college challenging. Not to really know how to navigate group relationships, you know, unspoken expectations, all of these different things that I had just never encountered before. And you know, that definitely stretched to dating and romantic relationships, which for me were pretty much a train wreck because I discovered that the um, let's try it and see how it works out didn't work so well mm, <laughs> in that particular setting. I do wish I'd had a little more trial and error when I was younger with dating relationships. I mean, having said that, I've been married, happily married for 33 years. So something went right. But I, I think of that transition as one of the more difficult and awkward ones that my education led me into. I did end up with a pretty lousy college degree because my parents' emphasis was on you're going to go somewhere that's safe and is going to teach you orthodoxy as opposed to you're going to go explore the life of the mind. I really do regret that. I always think of my actual undergraduate education as occurring during the first master's degree that I did. Um, so there was like a little bit of a like a developmental delay of a kind there. And, you know, I really I did spend 
although I don't think this is directly related to homeschooling, I did spend a lot of my adult life trying to recapture that sense of community that I had being in this very cultish church, which, as cultish churches tend to do, it disintegrated in a spectacular fashion you know, and sort of deprived me of the only community that I had ever known. So I, yeah, I spent a lot of time as an adult trying to either recapture that or refine it or figure out how to cope with it. That could have happened whether or not I had been homeschooled. But I think that because I was homeschooled, the church was the only community I had. And so when that fell apart, there wasn't anything to step in its way. Right. That resonates with me a lot because at a certain point, halfway through college, I also kind of distanced myself from that community. And just like you, it was everyone I knew. And there were so many people that I knew from all over the world, literally. And to to leave that was such a high cost that it seemed at some points, it seemed like just not even worth it to try going out and meeting other people when you had this whole community that were so dear to you. So that that resonates a lot. That that would probably be a, a big con for me too. Um, But it's a testament to the closeness, like you said, of the community that leaving it is so difficult or losing it in your case is so difficult because there's, you know, there's a meal train when you get sick and there's always someone to call and there's someone praying for you. And there's something so beautiful about that. And I always wonder, like, how do you, how do you, that's a question that I have left over, which we might get into in a minute here, questions we have left over, but how do you recreate that without the negatives? Like it, it, it seems impossible at times. And it's just, it's interesting to think about the fact that if I had been in a school setting, I would have had another circle of friends or another, another set of even not even friends, adults, I would have had another circle of adults who were interested in me and could have provided me with some guidance or some input, just an ear, a voice speaking into my life. Whereas because of the home education, when that went away, there was really nothing to stand in for it. Yeah. And you know, I've never even thought about it until this moment, but I had so many questions and doubts all through high school, but it wasn't until not only wasn't it until I was in college that I was able to actually leave, but it wasn't until I was in college and got myself involved in a club oh. of, of people who I, I was like-minded. We were the human rights club and we were any protest we were there. And, <laughs> but they were people who, who really cared about me. And it was the first time in my life I had other people who cared about me. So that makes a lot of sense that if I had not been homeschooled, I might have changed directions quite a bit earlier in my life because you need people. You just can't. No man is an island, as someone famous once said. (laughs) Someone famous did say that. And it's so (laughs) so very true. Well, talk a little bit about the question that that has left you with, the unresolved question, perhaps. The unresolved questions. I think the one for me that I think about a lot, especially becoming a teacher myself, is this idea of education versus indoctrination. As a kid, it almost seems like, you know, in the grammar stage, if if you're talking about it from a classical lens, kids almost need something to just accept. Like I, I was the same politics and religion as my parents and very much so as an eight year old, I really believed what they believed, but then it was almost natural for me as an adolescents to start questioning those things. So I wonder with education, if you almost have to provide students with some ideas about the world, but how do you do that in a way where they're allowed to question, they're allowed to formulate their their own identity? How do you educate a child without indoctrinating them with your own ideas? And interestingly enough, you could Again, like with my family, looking from the outside in, you might see kids who you think are indoctrinated. They're taught very strong things every day and taken to church every day and sent to intense summer camps every summer and dress a certain way. But at the same time, there was this like read all these books and question all these materials. So I I think about that a lot. How do you educate without indoctrinating? And what does that look like in a public school setting, in a homeschool setting, whatever setting you're in? What does that look like? Yeah. And um, I I don't think we're going to answer any of these sort of final questions in this episode. (laughs) Maybe we could return to them because, I mean, mine is to me is equally unresolved, which is I can look back at my own education and think to myself, I wish that had been different and that had been different and that had been different. And those particular things that I've identified, I tried to address with my own children uh, who are now 31, 29, 26 and 22. I don't think I succeeded 
I mean, I addressed those particular things. It's sort of an outgrowth of parenting, right? You mm -hmm. you identify certain things your parents did that you don't want to repeat. Right. And those you avoid. But then you introduce this whole new set of things that your kids will look back on and say, yeah, the one thing I'm not going to do is that. Right. And, uh, you know, so I, I wonder, I wonder, I, they were clearly, you know, I encouraged my kids to go to, to better schools than the one that I had been to. I feel that I was I was much less protective of them in ways that I had found stifling. But did that actually result in a better outcome for them? Um, mm. You know, maybe at some point we'll have to have them on and ask them or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I will have to think about that for a future podcast as well. <laughs> yeah, it's just that's just one of the unanswered questions in my mind. Mm -hmm. I will say this. I have absolutely no resentment about my childhood. I can look back on it and say, that was not good without feeling resentment because, you know, that all of that led me to where I am now and where I am now is good. So I can see that as, you know, threads that are dark instead of light and I could wish there were less of them, but they're still part of the fabric that makes up who I am. And so I don't um, regret is the wrong word. I mean, there are things I regret. I think I'll just stick with resent. I don't resent them. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I think to me, there is no benefit to resentment. When I was first leaving in college, there were definitely things that I resented and I could tell stories that sounded weird and crazy and tell my friends and they were like, oh, but looking back now, I think I, I'm coming to a point of agreeing with you more and more that especially when I started teaching public school, I was like, wow, my parents really wanted the best for me. And yeah. they may have done things that I won't do with my kids, like you said, but isn't that all of us? You know, yes. I'm not I'm not a parent yet, but I already am thinking about it like, oh, what are the things I'm going to do that my my kids are going to um, well, change? Well, I, I definitely played a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan for my kids, uh, carried that over from my childhood, and that is uh, something we have continued to enjoy. So that's, that's, that's a plus. That is a plus. And yeah. there are so many pluses when you, when you look back at, at the things that, that we got growing up. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for joining us and just getting to know uh, a little bit about who we are and how we are approaching education. There are so many things that we're looking forward to talking to each other about. We're going to bring on some great guests and we hope you'll come and join us again. Thank you all for listening.